Hello and welcome to 318 podcast. My name is Peter Wright. I'm head of communications here at the charity 318 and I'm joined again by Justin Humphreys who is our CEO for Safeguarding and we're going to be talking about our Safeguarding pledge that we launched earlier this year that really gives people a positive way of engaging with some of the issues that we as a church um, are experiencing around abuse and around safeguarding. So we'll be working through the six statements of the pledge and we're going to take one per episode and just spend a bit of time talking through each element, what that might mean for us, why we've put that together in the pledge and what that might mean for us and the action we can take as a result. I guess the best place to start for us then is how did the pledge come about? What was it that prompted us to put this together? So we launched this back at the early part of this year of 2020, about February, March. Um, And it was really as a result of seeing some of the sort of horrific stories around um, abuse, wanting to do something positive uh, to respond to that and give people a tool that they could use uh, to respond as well. So should we go back to how that came about and Mm -hmm. what really motivated us to put that together? Yes. So earlier this year, that's um, 2020, um, I think we we got to a point where almost every day there was a new news story uh, that was hitting um, hitting media channels. New story about um, failures in and across the church in relation in relation to safeguarding, and certainly, I think in in the wake of all of that. Who just began to think what what does this actually mean for the church uh, and have we have we gotten to crisis point with it so more than it just being flavor of the day you know the variety of things that we were seeing coming through that that just seemed to span the church in um a wide variety of, of traditions um, and denominations. Let, let's let's put it like that. Um, so it was representative. It was frequent, um, and it was highlighting a range of concerns of a safeguarding nature across the church in the UK. Um, and I think we just got to a point, didn't we, where we kind of thought, is this? Um, has this got to breaking point and is there something more something new that's needed to bring people's attention back bring some focus back to um to these issues and almost in a sense say enough's enough mm. well, i think i think you're right cause it wasn't just one individual case was it it was um it was seeing a collection of them over quite a quite a period of time and i guess it was that the, the reaction of people seeing what happened and wanting change to happen and I guess in a sense being frustrated or maybe angry even that change wasn't happening um, in the way that it should do and not really having a channel to direct that energy into anything anything positive wasn't it it was kind of a, uh, a sense of wanting to do something but not really seeing a way that they could do anything as a result of what they were witnessing. Yeah absolutely. Um... And I think particularly when you think about the experiences of survivors of abuse, um, particularly within the context of the church, what we were hearing consistently was um, that their voice wasn't being heard, um, that they had um, tried and tried and tried again to um, bring different parts of the church to a place of acknowledgement of acceptance and indeed repentance but seeing um, no sufficient movement and in fact seeing you know repeated uh, occasions where they were just um, ignored um, pushed aside not welcomed in terms of them expressing their voice Um, and of course what happens there is you, you you get into you get into a spiral situation which which doesn't produce um, 
doesn't produce the kind of dialogue that then results in, in meaningful change or certainly not quick enough. So on the back of all the cases that we were seeing reported, we were also seeing this pattern that seemed to be um, forever returning to the headlines um, about the, the, the poor quality um, of engagement with survivors. So what is it that you think that, that you hope the pledge will achieve? I know one of the things is around sort of just general awareness raising, but there's there's more to it, isn't it? There's a real sense that we're trying to galvanise uh, change, that change will happen as a result of people uh, seeing how they can connect and commit to these these issues. Yeah, it, all of that. Um, and I, I guess fundamentally for us, and this is kind of um, embedded in our whole kind of rebrand and name change, making sure that the um, the activity of creating safer places for all people, but especially for those who are vulnerable, um, is seen very much as an integral part of our Christian walk. That it's not seen as that add-on um, tick box exercise oh yeah that's the safeguarding piece we have to do that so let's get the box ticked it's about saying no it, it's it's far more important than that and the mandate that we've taken and that we've kind of based our name upon from proverbs 31 8 it is exactly about that it's about saying let, let's put these issues front and center let's um, use them as an opportunity to demonstrate um our compassion, our understanding, uh, the importance of um, equality and recognising disadvantage um, and going the extra mile to addressing those issues and where possible stopping abuses and harm from occurring in the first place. It's about, you know, bringing it into the mainstream as, as a part of the outworking of our faith. So we were able to launch this pledge at the Justice Conference earlier this year with our uh, patron, Joe Aldred, and to talk to people about what, what the pledge meant and to explain some of the background to it. And I think one of the things for me that I found really, uh, really helpful was seeing, seeing these issues of abuse, responding to abuse, creating places that are safe for everybody as a justice issue. It is around uh, issues of justice uh, that these these two things are are connected. How how do you think? Why do you think those two things have become so disconnected within church that it is seen as a bit of a uh, a tick box exercise rather than th something that's integral to what we believe and how we outwork our faith? At a simplistic level, I do actually wonder whether it's just that we have lost sight of the instructions and the mandate that that we have been given throughout scripture, throughout the Old and the New Testament, um, to, uh, to be looking out for uh, the widows, the orphans, the disadvantaged, the oppressed, the disaffected, the marginalized. Um, it seems very much easier perhaps to look outside the church and say, oh, look at that that's happening. Isn't that awful? We've got to do something about that. To actually turning the mirror upon ourselves as the church and recognizing that not everything is great in our own backyard mm. um, and there are things which happen despite our efforts there are things that happen because of our neglect and our omission to take appropriate action as much as the experiences that are brought before us that happen outside of the church but get brought into the context of church in the hope that we might be able to bring some help and resolution. Um, so that kind of disconnect that you talk about um, might be fundamentally about the fact that this is painful for the church mm. because actually we have to accept that we have a part to play. And um, hitherto, we may not have done our part particularly well. So acknowledging that is difficult, is painful. Um, and maybe that's also a bit of a hurdle for people. Because um, I think there is that need for self-reflection big time uh, at these points in time. And for us all to be prepared to say, yeah, we probably haven't done everything that we, we ought to have done, that we could have done. Um, and we have to take our responsibility seriously in terms of putting that right. 
And that element is there in the pledge, isn't it? So if we just talk through those six elements, so for people that haven't seen it or aren't aware, uh, there's six statements or six um, points within the pledge that we're asking people to consider, to commit to, to take action on. Uh, the first being to speak up, the second to put survivors first, the third to conceal nothing, the fourth to take responsibility, and that's exactly what we've just been talking about, uh, the fifth to make change happen, and then the sixth one to hold each other mutually uh, accountable. So we're going to take the first one uh, and talk about speaking up. Um, so one of the issues we found is around the, the sort of silence around these issues of abuse can sometimes be almost more deafening than, than people's voices being raised. And it can leave those uh, who have been abused to be the sole voice uh, speaking out against um, what they've experienced and against the issues. So the first thing really is how can we use our voice and our influence to both publicly, but also privately speak up about the injustice of abuse and the need for change. I mean, there's so many examples that we find in the Bible around um, God calling people to speak up against injustice, to speak up against uh, things that are not in line uh, with the principles of, of Christianity. And I think one of the guiding principles for us, obviously, is that verse from Proverbs, 31.8 that uh, talks about speaking out on behalf of the voices and for the rights of all who are vulnerable. So it's not just uh, those that have no voice, but for all those that find themselves in, in that situation. So do you think that's, um, do you think the church really um, welcomes that call, sees the, the need for that and can really link the two together? Do you think that's something that most Christians would say, yes, I can I can see that as a as a Christian, the Bible calls me to speak up for others, to speak up for those who uh, need me to do that? Uh, well, that's a really difficult question. Um, I would like to think so. <laughs> um, I would like to think that the majority of Christians would see this as their responsibility and would see that that mandate. Um, you know, so whether it be the Proverbs 31, 8, whether it be um, Micah 6, 8, you know, th these things should really be uppermost in our minds. Um, and I suspect that the difficulty comes when the spotlight is shone on us as individuals and we are faced with the reality, which might mean that we feel like we're a lone voice because that's never a comfortable place to be um, and I and I wonder whether there is something about that, that that's often at play and you know let, let's be honest about that and say that we, we probably all find ourselves in those situations from time to time. So we kind of talked a little bit about the the why the need is there and the fact that it's a really uh, biblical principle that we use our voice to speak up and I'm just thinking about some of the people who are going to be listening to this uh, maybe they are uh, in a leadership role or maybe they're, they're not maybe they they go to church and they um, they, they just attend on a Sunday and they're kind of thinking um, you know how can I do that how what, what's that look like for me in, in the setting that I'm in how can I use my voice uh, to speak about these issues? What, what sort of things do you think we could uh, give to them, uh, explain to them about how they might be able to do that more effectively uh, where they are? I mean, I think there's a whole range of things that, that we can do. Um, and that is um, being that, that champion. And, and there, are, uh, there are some churches um, that actually use that terminology of, of children's champions and, you know, not wanting to exclude um, old, older people from that. But the whole concept of, of, of champions, the person who, if nobody else does, they will be the ones who are there kind of on the sidelines, so to speak, who will constantly be saying, what about safeguarding? What about safeguarding? Um, but I think also um, the opportunity to deal with some of these difficult issues from the platform. So church leaders um, preaching sermons about the importance of creating safer places for people within the life 
uh, of the church would be really important. Um, it was only at um, New Wine last year that, that I asked a, a group of gathered church leaders how many of them had either delivered such a preach or had heard one. And in the room of 50, 60 people, about three or four hands went up. Mm. Um, you know, th there's a real gap there. How, how do we normalize and mainstream um, the issue of safeguarding and creating safer places so that it doesn't become that um, that that odd, that difficult thing to discuss. It actually becomes it's normalized. It's part of our everyday, every week conversation. Um, so that would be another key area to to make sure that we can kind of ta tackle it from an, a number of different um, ends, so to speak. Um, safeguarding Sunday um, again, w would be an opportunity to do that. And, and we will be, uh, again, this year, putting together a resource pack for that to encourage churches to celebrate and to honour um, the work that is done to create those safer places, um, giving it, again, some, um, some profile to helping people understand why it is we do it. Um, because the more we create the conversations, the more we normalize it into everyday language and discussion, um, perhaps the less difficult it becomes when part of that conversation might need to get quite challenging. That's really helpful. Um, what about, I'm thinking about maybe moving off from individuals now onto perhaps churches in general and maybe charities as well. How can we as groups of churches, how can we maybe use our collective voice more? Do you think there's opportunities uh, for that in society for us to be able to speak out on some of these issues as well? Well, I think there are. And, um, you know, so our, our ability to engage in government consultations, let's say on policy change, legislative change, um, those are key opportunities for the church to have its collective voice heard. Um, I, I genuinely long for the day when society at large sees the church as an active participant, as a leader, as pioneers in this effort, um, where we have rightly had to acknowledge our own shortcomings um, but in that place, we have been able to build um, to a place of better strength where our, our voice becomes um, credible um, when it is spoken into um, into the public square. Um, I long for that to be the case. And that was partly around the, the establishment of the all party parliamentary group on safeguarding and faith settings that we've been instrumental in setting up. It's about saying, look, um, there is a role for the, the church and other faith groups to speak into these issues. Um, there is a huge responsibility that rests on our shoulders um, as much as there is an opportunity to engage probably with um, more people in the context of their families than any other environment in society provides. Mm. What a huge, what a huge thing that is. Um, but, our, our continual discussion on key issues hopefully will raise awareness to the fact that we're not only talking about um, what is out with the church, but what is also within the church in relation to these issues. Um, we have a huge opportunity there. That is a really inspiring vision, isn't it? And I think you're right. If, if that collective voice was to be raised around these kinds of issues, we would see we would see such a change. We would see so many lives impacted for good um, that just the being able to be a part of that is, is quite inspiring, isn't it? It's quite an exciting thing. Um, and I think maybe sometimes because these issues are really dark and um, can be quite hard sometimes to grapple with, um, we can sometimes lose some of that element of hope and of excitement around actually if we can get get involved in that and we can participate in things like like this actually there's 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 quite a sense of actually we could achieve something really significant not just within the confines of the church but for the country as a, as a whole um some, do some real good within society yeah excellent so that's number one speaking up next time we hope to look at um the second statement which is around putting survivors first which uh, again is another area where we've 
Um, we've seen some good efforts being made in some places, but still a lot of work to be done. Uh, so do join us for that. If you have not yet uh, seen the pledge and you'd like to know more about it and to take part, uh, you can find that at 318.org forward slash pledge. But Justin, thanks very much for speaking to, to us today. That's been really helpful and I hope people have found that really useful and inspiring for them uh, in whatever role and setting they are in. So thank you. Great, thanks very much.